you. At Big Data SV 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsors WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. And Actian, accelerating Big Data 2.0. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live at the Hilton in Santa Clara in Silicon Valley for Big Data Silicon Valley or Big Data SV. Go to the hashtag Big Data SV. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. This is theCUBE, our flagship program where we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm joined by my co-host today, Jeff Frick with theCUBE. And our next guest is uh, Jim Hare, product marketing at Actian uh, Analytics. Actian is the emerging company that has a lot of uh, a lot, of, a lot of secret jewels that were put together uh, for big data. Jim, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. We've had you guys on uh, a bunch of times here in Silicon Valley, big news with the company. Uh, share with the folks uh, first uh, a little bit about the Actian history and how you fit into that, how the, the analytics piece of our Excel fits into it as part of an acquisition. Give a quick, give a quick overview of what happened. Sure. Um, well, Actian got its, start, its roots really in the, the operational database set at the house. Uh, it was a private equity firm that went off and really saw value in uh, untapped, unvalued resources and assets and has built the company on that foundation. So most recently, they acquired companies like Pervasive and Parexcel. And where I fit into the equation is I was brought in to actually look at these assets and figure out how they could be combined in interesting ways to really unlock that value. And the most recent announcement is around this Actian Analytics platform, where what we've done is looked at all these capabilities and combined them to really unlock that value. And today, if you look at Actian, it's one company, one voice, one message, one platform. We're here in Silicon Valley, obviously, with a lot of innovation, and you're seeing a lot of people moves being made in the big data space. Obviously, we've been covering it, you know, really at the beginning, and the Hadoop movement really kind of put a face to unstructured data, taking uh, data parking it away, storing it away on commodity hardware, and exploding that out in analytics and insight, et cetera, et cetera. And you're starting to see the maturization of, of that space. And so big data just doesn't equal Hadoop anymore. We had folks on from Datastax talking about Cassandra. We've had folks that saying, hey, we have SQL Server, which is you know SQL database. So the database world, meet, meeting software, meeting platforms, um, is a really kind of hard thing to navigate. So big data just doesn't mean Hadoop. So I want you to explain to the folks out there from your perspective, the role of Hadoop, the role of other platforms, and, and where it needs to go. Is it, is it being unified? Is it, is it going to continue to be dynamic? Uh, what does that mean, big data doesn't equal Hadoop? What, is, sure. what does that mean? Well, if you look at it, you know, a lot of people were already dealing with lots of data with traditional sources. You know, they had data warehouses and databases, and with the uh, flurry of, of the volume of new data coming from new sources, even sensor data with the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. There was no easy way to manage not only those new data types, but also those different, that volume of data. So hence, people were looking for new technologies to handle that kind of uh, different types of data. And Hadoop was explored and, and evaluated as an interesting way of, of not only handling that data, but also becoming a low cost storage mechanism, really a data lake, a landing zone for all this data. And so I think people began to associate big data with simply Hadoop. The reality is something far from it. Hadoop is great for handling things such as when you need to, again, store that data, you need to do things like cleanse it, do some data science and maybe some data discovery to really find new relationships with that data. But people now what they want to do is take some of these data and combine it with their on-premise enterprise data. So how do you do that? Um, so if you look at it, it really comes down to acknowledgement that you have a collection of different platforms, one of which is Hadoop for handling certain types of data, again, sort of being that low cost data storage area. You have your data warehouse, so big data still involves that data warehouse, and really sitting in the middle is the need for an analytics platform to address another aspect of big data, which is really providing the ability to handle more sophisticated analytics and do it at a low latency, and also do it in a much more price performance, cost effective way. So with the Actian Analytics platform, what we've created is the ability to interoperate and cooperate and complement and connect to these other types of platforms, be it Hadoop, be it your data warehouse, or even streaming data for that matter. So it's really for people to completely solve the big data problem, they really need to consider an ecosystem of all three types of platforms. So John, I wonder if you could share with us some customer examples or some of the things you're seeing out in the field that really take what you just said and put it into practice Absolutely. to see business value. Yeah, in fact, one of the customers that was speaking here at Strata this week was Evernote. 
Uh, Evernote is uh, one of the leaders in providing uh, online capabilities for people to store notes, videos, you know, just thinking about what... I'm, I'm, I'm an Evernote guy. There you go. <laughs> so behind the scenes, they actually use Hadoop to actually store a lot of the information, both in terms of the assets that you're storing away, as well as information about you as a customer. And they're using the Acting Analytics platform to take a look at your usage patterns, as well as, you know, the types of things you store to determine if perhaps you're ready to actually move from their free version to a paid subscription. So that's how they're actually using our platform today. So they really saw the value in having the complement of Hadoop and an analytics platform together. One of the things that uh, obviously Strata Conference is, and we've been covering for many years is the notion of insights. And insights is kind of like the holy grail, it's the bumper sticker for what, what people want. And you know, IT has insights on the IT side and on the business side, you're seeing a demand for business changing, top line revenue. You know, this is kind of the banter that's being kicked around. So you know, insights is not that easy. So, you know, you know, when you have you know a clean sheet of paper or you're a consumer company, maybe you can build a system from scratch, but for most folks who want insights out of their business, uh, it's challenging. Could could you just talk a little bit from your perspective, um, how are customers really getting insights from the data lake, the data landfill, active data, passive data, all these new data sources out there. Uh, talk about the challenges and the opportunities around, one, laying the foundation for systems to do that, and then how do you get insights? Good, great question. In fact, if you look at our platform with our diagram, you know, I think people hear the word big data, and they naturally gravitate towards, oh, where are my data sources? What's all out there? What can I do with that? when the reality is they need to be looking at the right-hand side, which we call really the value. You know, what is it you could be doing with all this data? In fact, I challenge, you know, when I have the opportunity to speak with different clients, um, I sort of challenge, especially the business folks, to say, if you had unlimited access to all the data that's out there, unlimited analytics, what would you do differently? And the challenge has been up to now is they felt so constrained and beaten down that they haven't been able to think outside the box. Now as a result of having faster analytics, more information at their fingertips, it's creating a revolution in terms of how people are, are looking at analytics and data to transform their businesses. Um, you know, what we're seeing is uh, several different industries. I mentioned, you know, for instance, Evernote. There are other companies in the digital media and advertising space that are combining now location-based information along with information about, you know, where, what type of, of, of places you, not only you visit, but also what kinds of places you shop. And they're starting to marry up all this different kinds of data to really understand it and, and really create a personalized targeted advertising campaign directed at the individual versus sort of a broad segment of the, the population, as an example. So that's one change. We're also seeing things in, in the financial services area where clearly you know, fraud detection is is one area that people are really trying to understand how you can detect and even prevent you know people from actually penetrating both in terms of you know be it credit card transaction fraud or simply employees actually taking assets inadvertently out of, out of the company um, as well as in things such as uh, risk management we have several large banks that are using our platform and prior to using Actian it was some cases taking a day for them to actually run the analytics to determine what the risk exposure was. And two things occur. One is that they may be making decisions that actually put them in a situation where they're actually taking on more risk. Um, but more important is that they're not actually adapting to the market conditions as well. So having lower latency analytics is what is really helping organizations be able to think differently about how they actually uh, run their companies. In fact, if you think about it, if, if it takes hours or even days to run some of these queries, you know, what was happening in the past, the analyst would click, simply kick, kick off the job, come back after lunch and figure out if it's still running. And, and they're not able to think in terms of those interactive, you know, asking different questions of the data. Right. That's all changing now. It's interesting, because we always talk about people, process, and tech, and it's a combination of the three is how this thing can, continues to evolve. And, and what you just outlined, basically now the tech's getting a, a little bit ahead of the of the people and how they'll have to change the way that they think about things because they've got so much capability um, to do things that before were, were not even possible. Absolutely. In That's fact, great. one of the things I would say is that I think in the area of big data, the next element that hasn't been really tapped into and discussed is the whole psychology of big data. 
how is it transforming how the analyst, you know, use the tools and use analytics to do di things differently in the organizations? Yeah. I think that'll be the next wave. And the pressure to get it right the first time is significantly changed too, right? It's almost like an agile decision process making as opposed to trying to map out the exact structure of the question because it's going to take so long to get the answer. Now, as you just said, it's more of an iterative process where you can start, explore, get feedback rapidly, explore a different direction, deeper, go a different way. So it is a very different way to attack the problem than the kind of monolithic thing that used to uh, mirror kind of software development. Absolutely, and, and the other part of it is, you know, the market conditions are changing faster as well. That's true. So how do organizations, you know, react and change, and you really use analytics to outperform, and it differentiates them as a, from their competitors. Jim, I want to ask you about, uh, um, back to the analytics piece, talk about unifying earlier. Um, the demand when people look at the data, they, they have a couple things in mind I want to get your perspective on. Seamless workflow, and you're seeing things like in-memory kind of accelerate that with in, you know, in-memory kind of capabilities. Sure. Seamless workflow, and then unified management around the analytics, uh, whether it's predictive, prescription, or whatever the analytics, advanced analytics might be. Uh, whether it's ingestion and to targeted analytics. So, so comment on the seamless workflow integration and then how, how do people manage it? Gotcha, good question. Um, <clears throat> what we've created as part of our platform is the ability for people to, first of all, start with connecting to those data sources. And then from there, um, really look at taking that and, and bringing it either uh, into something like Hadoop, but also the analytics platform, or even their data warehouse. Where I'm going with this is the idea of actually creating workloads that are based on data flows, where you're actually sort of, first of all, laying out what is that flow of information, how will it actually flow through the various systems, and then being able to sort of essentially embed that in the analytics process itself. So up to now, a lot of times what you have are these silos of information and people have to learn different tools, different ways of, of actually moving the data, analyzing it, moving it on to the next step. Just imagine having the ability that you can actually drag and drop, sort of define, I want to take this data, combine it with this other data, transform it, here's the type of analytics I want to be able to apply to it, and then even automate the actions based on that information. This is what we call the data flow, and this is one of the things that we offer as part of the Acting and Analytics platform part of our pervasive acquisition. And we're going to see more of people wanting to actually have these workloads and work streams predefined so they can do faster analytical iterations, be able to have one person define it and have those shared as assets across the organization. And they, that way they also don't have to get into becoming programmers, like learning MapReduce. Because uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing. There's very few people that really uh, understand to really even how to program and use it effectively. So we're trying to abstract that up, to your point, John, which is really to make it you know, simple and easy for sort of the common users to be able to use these systems versus having to have people that are skilled experts. One of the things we're hearing here at the Strata Conference and Big Data SV is the SQL on Hadoop, or SQL, because SQL's in a pre-existing market, obviously it has some legacy in there. Um, obviously that's a transformation, but it's also kind of a compatibility, got to be compatible with that SQL. How do you guys look at that trend? Does it affect you guys? Do you guys play into it? Um, you extend that? What's your take on the current buzz around SQL on fill in the blank? Gotcha, good. Um, if you look at it, um, you know, one of the things, again, sort of tying in with your previous point, is the fact that people want to use the existing skills and knowledge that they already have. Um, what do people mostly know, for a lot of cases, to how to access data? SQL. So, hence the reason that people are looking for capabilities, how they can use SQL to tap into uh, things like Hadoop. What we've created as part of our uh, platform, I'll call it more of a, an, I guess, ecoskeleton system around Hadoop. And what we mean by that is almost like the Iron Man where, you know, you have uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, out there, you know, with the superhuman powers as a result of having this special armor. What we've done with our platform is embellished and embraced Hadoop. One of the challenges is that, again, people have to know MapReduce and, and really understand the bowels of, of Hadoop to get the value out of it. What we provide is the ability for people to analyze quickly the information on Hadoop, figure out what the data is of value, and then move it into a, uh, an analytics platform for lower latency analytics. So we do th the, the data directly on Hadoop. We simplify how people can bring that into an analytical database for faster processing. And then the third part is being able to, on demand, 
reach out to Hadoop, reach out to their data warehouse to get the freshest data. So having a, a, a platform that actually embraces and plugs directly in Hadoop is where our customers are really wanting. Because sitting on top of that are your, your traditional BI visualization tools that speak SQL. And they want to be able to, to simply use SQL, reach down into a platform, access whatever data, be it Hadoop, be it in the data warehouse. What are some of the things that people might not want to know, that might want to know, that don't know about Actium? What would you share with them? Uh, so you guys have a pretty robust platform. You, you guys put together some good corporate development kind of with this, with the equity uh, company underneath it. A lot of cool platform features with some applications that, with analytics, for instance. What should people know about Actium that they might not be aware of that you'd like to share with them? Sure. Um, I think one of the things, when, when people are looking for the fastest, um, lowest latency platform for doing analytics, they come to Actium. Case in point is Amazon's Redshift runs on our platform. We're the engine underneath that. MicroStrategy's cloud runs on the Actium Analytics platform. So not only do we have a lot of enterprise and even medium-sized businesses running our platform to address interesting problems, but when large organizations that are looking for a fast, robust uh, platform, that's when they look at uh, Actium. So I think that's one of the things I think to, to bring in case in point. The other thing is that um, you know when you look at making a decision for an analytics platform, up to now everybody's sort of been, uh, I guess, looking at things like hardware appliances. You know, that was sort of the rage for the longest time. The problem is that hard work gets antiquated over time. What we provide is a software platform that gives you the choice of running on whatever commodity hardware you want or running in the cloud. So you have, a lot of cases, customers want to have that hybrid environment where they have some data and some analytics in the cloud, some on, some on premise. We provide that kind of flexibility. The other part of that is the way we've optimized our platform we take advantage of the new chip innovations. So as new hardware rolls out, faster chips, compression, all these things built into the chips, we take full advantage of that. So that's one of the major benefits of having our platform. Jim, I want to ask you, obviously, in the, in the product side, you have to look at the marketplace and understand what's going on in the, in the market, the business, then look at the technology and kind of the value proposition, kind of tie that together between engineering and the roadmap, et cetera. So I got to ask you, obviously, we, we talked about you know, in memory, we see cloud as an enabler uh, from an infrastructure standpoint in terms of time to value. Um, you're seeing customers look at the cloud and the DevOps movement has really shown that application developers can do stuff pretty quickly. Right? And then having a platform uh, like what you guys have and others is, is really a way to tap into that and scale it. Um, so I want to ask you what your take is when you talk to customers around their investment. They have to build up, they have to do more with less, and now actually make real investments, not just downsize or consolidate, but now they have to kind of do mobile, being, bring your own device to where all kinds of new things are being invested. So the question is about developers. What does the enterprise look at from a developer standpoint? In the old days, remember the mainframe days, you had in-house developers. Mm -hmm. That kind of went away over the past couple of years. Now there's a resurgence of, okay, I got to do this, who's going to build it? So people are hiring. What is that developer? What does the enterprise developer look like um, that, that can take advantage of the things that you're building? Is it the data science guys? Is it the you know, classic front end <laughs> developers? I mean, enterprises are looking to figure out that developer equation. It might not be that Microsoft developer. It might not be that old school developer. It might be a DevOps guy. It might right. be a JavaScript or Rails or Python. Or What's the profile of, of the kind of developer? Well, I, I think the person who would be looking at the analytics platform as an example is someone primarily is going to be more coming from an architectural background where they're looking to figure out our existing architecture perhaps is fine for today but we need to be looking for the future and what they're looking at in some cases is actually taking some of these capabilities and running it in a cloud-based environment where they don't have to stand up their own hardware their own infrastructure they can actually build a prototype of this kind of environment in the cloud and then once they figure out you know, what that really should look like, they'll actually bring that on premise. So having the cloud, as an example, is a great way for organizations to really do proof of concepts, try out concepts, before they actually implement it and make the significant investment in the organization. Um, the other kind of a role we, we see is, you, know, you mentioned you know, it's sort of the developer. The developer comes into play when you know, it comes time to really say, okay, this is the technology, now we want to start really building the applications. And in some cases, obviously, it's going to be maybe Hadoop. In the case of an analytics platform, it's you know, commonly people that just sort of, first of all, uh, know, have DBA skills, 
but what we're seeing now is this really this evolution into this data scientist who's really being the owner of the analytics platform and really the sort of the overseer of all that data and really tying in the value of that data to the business use case. It was interesting though, I just met with one of our, our customers, Jiwire, this week, and he was saying one of the biggest challenges he's facing is a lot of the data scientists that are coming to the market right now don't know SQL. <laughs> they know all these new technologies, right? They know R and these predictive <laughs> analytics, for the right? Guys, right? But it almost reminds me of back to the future. I mean, people are forgetting the roots in terms of how you access all this other information that's already on premise and of value right. is through SQL. So he's having the hardest time finding those kinds of skills. So. It's a clash of the, of, of the two worlds coming together. You see the SQL guys trying to move into this new world and, and they're fluent, but they also, it's just a little bit different. It's not, the, it's a square peg kind of in a round hole. They got to figure it out. So you're seeing kind of a blending, a hybrid developing. So, you know, it's interesting. I always like to look at that because we're hearing from everyone we talk to, all the big vendors, uh, the legacy guys to the new school. It's like, and you know, I need developers in the enterprise, but it's not your classic old developer that you know that was weaned on you know I mean they may have Java but there's other things going on but like it's just it's just a major challenge right now and it reminds me of the Jeff of the mainframe days back in the days where everyone had in-house developers you know from whether it was from the COBOL days all the way down to essentially programming uh, in-house apps but now you have a completely different app environment you have could literally have thousands of apps in an enterprise so we find that kind of challenging we're trying to get some signal there so we appreciate that um, anything to add on the um, um, standards versus open source debate we had yesterday. You know, obviously open source is, is huge, but you, know, you have to have some sort of proprietary advantage um, to build your business, have some competitive advantage. What's your take on that? Um, well, I always like to say open source is like free like a puppy, right? Puppy's free, but a lot more responsibility <laughs> that comes along with that, right? In terms of- Get the pooper the scooper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know? and all the training that goes along with it as well. Um, so some organizations are going to be happy to bring in open source and, and deal with it at that level. The reality is I think people are starting to at least acknowledge that, yep, having open source somewhere in, in the technology stack is great, but you need all the enterprise readiness, the enterprise hardening, the things that really allow you to bring in the organization and really use it for production use cases. I mean, if you want to use open source as sort of, again, the pilot, I'll call it the data science experiment, you know, the lab, great. But when you really want to try to bring it in, you, you really need to make sure it's, it's ready to be used in the enterprise. Because if you're betting your business on it, it's got to work. Well, it's awesome to have you here. I wanted to get a last question for you before we break. And the next guest is summarize the show, this moment in time where we at Big Data, SV, Silicon Valley, you know, ton of innovation, a lot of new startups coming in. We saw the show, a lot of names we've never heard of. Some may be around, some might consolidate within the ecosystem and some might break out and be winners on their own. Um, valuations are high in some of the private companies. And also you're seeing the big guys looking at M&A market. So, a lot of growth opportunities. Clearly, there's a lot of meat on the bone here. So what's your take for the folks out there? Share with them, what is the moment? How would you summarize the big story here at Big Data SV and Strata Conference in Silicon Valley? What's the moment about? If you look at the past couple years, this show, Strata, really appealed, I'll call it more, to the geek audience. I mean, it was people here learning about the new technologies. This is the first time at a Strata event that I've really seen an inflection point where it's really focused now, not entirely, but we're starting to see that on the business outcomes, the business value, where people are now wanting to really understand not only can we, what you do with the data, but what made it transformational. Uh, you're also seeing, for instance, some of the sessions here talking about the, the ethics and privacy issues as well. So I really see this as sort of an inflection point where big data is really maturing. We're really moving into what can we do with big data, not focused on technology, but much more on outcomes. Jim, thanks for coming in on theCUBE. We appreciate Acti and great platform. You guys are coming out of the woodwork, real uh, smoking hot uh, platform. Great buzz here at the show. Uh, congratulations. This is theCUBE, Big Data SV, where all the action's happening in Silicon Valley, live at the Hilton, right across the street from the Strata Conference. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. I'm John with Jeff Frick here in live at the Hilton. <laughs>